Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor. I am Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And a very warm welcome to both our in-person audience and to our online audience. We are delighted that you can join us this evening for what is going to be a very special program. French upholstery, then in now, with Bruno Paulin Lopez, Master Artisan in Upholstery. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. And of course, this artisan um, lecture tradition is one that we're very, very proud to continue. Uh, today, our 238-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, um, our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, and I'm pointing up there for our in-person audience, which you're welcome to visit after tonight's talk, um, our General Society Library, of course, of which the lecture is taking place in this evening, and finally, our lecture series, and I'm very pleased to say our lecture series originally started in uh, 1838. Uh, for the online audience, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A section to submit questions and rather than raise your hand or use the chat section. And of course, you can submit questions at any point during the talk this evening. For our in-person audience, we do ask that you hold off your questions until the end of the presentation. We have had the great pleasure of having Bruno Paulin Lopez speak here several times on the topic of upholstery and are so pleased to welcome him back this evening. Born in Paris, after graduating, Bruno worked in different high-end upholstery shops throughout Paris, including securing a position at the Ritz Hotel at Place Vendôme, fabricating, managing, and maintaining the different stylistic decors throughout the hotel. In the early 1880s, Bruno moved to the United States. He quickly established himself as a traditional continental upholster. His private clientele includes award-winning architects, interior design firms, and celebrity clients. Its collaborations include uh, the Cincinnati Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of the City of New York, the New Gallery, the Abraham Lincoln House, the Morris Jumel Mansion, and the Park Avenue Armory to which he was presented with an Interior Restoration Award for his work in the Veterans Room, sealing his reputation for historical interior restoration. He also recently recreated the 1810 interiors of the Morris Jamel Mansion, curating all the window treatments and the Empire style furniture as well as being the resident upholster for the Park Avenue Armory, curating various 19th century upholster pieces, notably a rare set of chairs designed by Louis Comfort Tiffany. Um, as I said, we, I was fortunate enough to have a preview of um, Bruno's presentation the other day, and this is, it's really a most fantastic uh, presentation. It is now my huge pleasure to introduce to you Bruno Paulin, Paulin Lopez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I feel honored to be back for this third lecture on traditional upholstery. And thank you so, so much um, for coming. And thank you, um, Karen and Victoria. Um, for those online and across the pond, um, thank you for showing up at this um, late hours. Um, I hope you will get enlightened by this presentation and live with a better and deeper understanding and appreciation of what French traditional upholstery is all about, as the subject matter is often misunderstood, underrepresented, frankly never seen, oftentimes underrated and only taught in Europe. When I first came to these shores in the early, early 80s, I was told my skill set was obsolete. Well, 40 years later, I can test my skill set is as sharp as ever. 
Traditional upholsters have been around for centuries and will be around for many more to come. So welcome to all of you and let's start this journey into France, August history of upholstery, where sophistication and quote, savoir faire is a way of life. I'm here tonight to educate, to advocate and to celebrate the refinements and subtleties of my trade. This lecture is after all a window into what defines French culture. As you can see on tonight's menu, I will attempt to go through 17 chapters, perhaps succinctly, but nevertheless entertaining. What is French upholstery? What makes it so French? Why is it so much different from other types of upholstery? One might argue and find similarities between French upholstery and French cuisine. Both are refined, require extensive training, have a vernacular impossible to translate in English. Both are represented by their respective guilds and both hold national trades competitions at the apprentice level as well as the journeyman level. Wrong button, sorry about that. Here we go. From antiquity to present day through the middle ages and the Renaissance, the upholstery trade has slowly evolved and is one of the oldest trades in the world. As you can see on this chart, French furniture styles expands from over 500 years and is still evolving to this day. Suffice to say, covering the upholstery evolution from the 1550s Renaissance to 1920s Art Deco and beyond would require a lengthy presentation. And therefore, I will focus tonight on the preeminent French styles well known to the sophisticated and European influenced New York City gentry. Out of these 24 styles of French furniture, I selectively picked a few to demonstrate the art of upholstery. So let's review a few styles and visually compare the different stylistic and decorative elements. Louis XIII, 1610, 1643. Simple and sharp shapes, turned and carved wood, upholstered seating, brass tack and fringe. Louis XIV, 1643-1715. Carved and gilded wooden frames, rectangular seats and backs, armrests extend to the front edge of the seat, upholstered backs are rigid and upright, straight legs connected with an X or an H stretcher between the legs. Louis XV, less symmetrical in design, armrests do not extend to the front seat edge, Chair backs are at a slight angle and rounded. Chair legs are also angled and cabriole or S-shaped. Wood is often decorated with intricate scrolls, medallions, or floral themes. Wood frames are gilded, painted, or waxed. Louis XVI, a return to more geometrical shapes. Chair backs are oval or shield-like in shape. Armrests once again meet the front of the seat. Chair legs are straight and often resemble columns. Decorative carving are more restrained, classical themes. Wood is painted, gilded, waxed, or varnished. As you can see in this particular slide, the chair belonged to Marie Antoinette, and you can see how wonderful the colors are, and you can imagine the interiors were vibrant at that period of time. This is another suite for the Comte d'Artois, Turkish suite that was totally restored and um, called Turkish because of the ornamentation and the festoons around the frame and on the back. Empire, 1804-1815, clean lines, heavy and dark wood, upholstery using primarily one color, claws, paws, wings, eagles, dolphin or swan adornments. Wood is painted, gilded or varnished. Second Empire or Napoleon III, 15, 1852 and 1870. Comfort, highly decorative, tufting, tassels and fringes. Wood is lacquered or gilded. Art Deco, exotic woods and marquetry, 
wood surfaces are lacquered or gilded, middle feet and decorative elements, comfort, bold geometric forms, bright colors, highly stylized geometric curves. Sorry about that. Here you have um, a few examples of the period, Jacques-Emile Ruhlmann, Jules Leleu, and Jean-Michel Franck. Here on this slide, you have Ellen Gray looking at her famous dragon's armchair. That armchair was from the estate of Yves Saint Laurent and was auctioned at Christie for $28 million in 2009. Contemporary, um, here you have the office of François Mitterrand at the Élysée Palace, furniture by Pierre Paulin. Pierre Paulin, 1927-2009, was a French furniture designer and interior designer. He redecorated the living, dining, smoking, and exhibition rooms at the Élysée Palace, private apartments for Pompidou in 1971. And in 1983, he furnished the office of François Mitterrand. Pierre Paulin is a graduate of Ecole Camando, and during that time, he started to stretch swimwear material over traditional chairs. Here are some examples of Pierre Paulin iconic chairs, the tongue chairs, the ribbon chair, and the mushroom chair. Now we will go back to the mechanism of upholstery, styles and shapes of seats, backs, and armrest. On this particular slide, you can see on the left, the evolution of a seat from Louis XIII to the 20th century. And as you go through um, the historical uh, chronology, you can see the seats being fatter and thicker and taller and as it goes in, um, in those styles, the Louis XV is very gracious and the Louis XVI and Empire are rather square looking. On the right side of um, the slides, you can see a cross section of a Louis XV chair that has um, rolls um, all around the, the um, periphery of the seat and the roll and the inside of the well is filled with uh, horsehair or Algerian grass. Again, here you have a contrast of seat profile. You have the Regence, Louis XV, Louis XVI, Louis XV transitional, Louis XVI, Directoire, and Empire. Various methods to upholster a seat with different materials. As you can see on the top left, um, this is a traditional seat, and regardless of what is used to upholster the seat, what is important is to keep the historical shape. Regardless of the period, it's all about the final shape, whether the arms, the seat, or the back. It is the appropriate historical shape that will make or break the value of the object. That notion is valid not only in traditional upholstery, but also in bespoke furniture as well, as it is our responsibility as professional upholsterers to carry out the designer's vision. Armrest and backs and seats. Louis XV is rather um, gracious, shaped like a bean, generous, and follow the curves line of the frame. Louis XVI, is more defined and square, stitched and fitted. Empire, cylindrical and tubular, very crisp and rigid looking. And the same look on an oblong Empire armrest. On this slide, you can see the difference between a Louis XV and an Empire and the evolution of the shapes and the forms in an upholstery. What is French upholstery? French upholstery is the ancestral trade of fabricating and forming sitting comfort with vegetal and animal fibers and shaping stylistic elements rooted in traditional know-how on historical artifacts. French upholstery is refined and delicate in its execution and requires hand dexterity as well as a trained eye to execute accurately the different stylistic expression of furniture designs throughout its cultural heritage. On the left slide, you can see 12 steps to build a sprung seat with vegetal fiber and horsehair. 
On the right slide, you can see 12 step to build a back, an oval back with horsehair. And the center slide show the supplies and tools needed to do this work. Upholstery training, um, traditional upholstery training in France, uh, you can go several routes. One route is to do an apprenticeship uh, with an alternance between trade school and workshop, two years diploma equivalent to an associate degree and four years diploma equivalent to bachelor of arts. It's governed by the French department of education and free tuition. You can also do a four year degree or a reconversion or second career degree. Trainings and training institutions are La Bonne Grande Technical College, Bull School of Applied Arts, Compagnon du Devoir. And all schools are curricula and curriculums are in accordance with the French Department of Education. In the UK, um, you have the British School of Upholstered Furniture and they offer uh, three stages AMUSF diploma, that stands for the Association of Master Upholsters and Soft Furnishers. Um, three years, one day per week, and a minimum of 650 contact hours. They also offer an advanced diploma with 260 contact hours, plus students are expected to do 400 hours self-initiated work slash research over that time. The left and right slides are depicting a class that I taught in the UK, and this is a um, medallion with a 16 chair, traditionally upholstered. In the United States, um, upholsteryeducation.com um, offer yearly workshops and um, in mostly in traditional upholstery, but also we offer um, contemporary upholstery with foam. The square footstool tabouret carré or the French upholsterer best friend. Um, this is a required project for the first year apprenticeship in France. The tabouret carré has to be um, executed plain or tufted and is required to do um, in order to graduate to the second year. The second year project is an oval back or medallion with a 16. And that is um, also required to upholster in a certain amount of hours in order to graduate and to obtain the certificate of professional aptitude. Here you can see um, the hands of uh, one of my interns doing a blind stitch on a Louis XV back. The purpose of that stitch is to bring the horse here forward and to maintain it as it will not collapse uh, when you put the fabric, it will, the shape will remain and the, um, structure will stay in place over time. Tools of the trade. And then and now. In traditional upholstery, um, you will have a, a series of hammer with specific usage. And you can see this, the, um, the um, similarities between uh, the slide on the left and the slide on the right. The hammers are the same and the regulators are the same. Here you have swing action hand pickers. They are designed to card and to pick either vegetal fiber, horsehair or wool. The left side represents a um, the poster in the 19th century. The center slide is current and the right slide is as well current. Those are electric pickers. They do the same job as the um, swing action picker, but there is a vacuum cleaner inside and it will clean and uh, they will clean the horsehair or the um, Spanish moss uh, in such a way that you can recycle them over time. 
then and now. The left slide is from the encyclopedia, which is most famous for representing the thought of the Enlightenment. According to Denis Diderot in the article Encyclopédie, the encyclopedia's aim was to change the way people think and for people to be able to inform themselves and to know things. He and the other contributors advocated for the secularization of learning away from the Jesuits. Diderot wanted to incorporate all of the world's knowledge into the encyclopedia and hoped that the text could disseminate all this information to the public and future generations. Thus, it is an example of democratization of knowledge. It was the first general encyclopedia to describe the mechanical arts. Here on the left, you have um, an engraving that dates from 1751. And on the right, you have two ladies upholstering um, chairs and this picture that, that's from 2021. Same position of the body, same methods, same hand gestures and similar tools. Here you have a class, um, picture of a class, current picture. You can see the students uh, sitting down on their little tabouret carré and upholstering the chairs. You have, it's, some, it's a co-ed class. You have about seven ladies and um, five guys, I think. Supplies and notions. Most of the supplies used in French traditional upholstery are, are natural and sometimes organic. Each class that you see represented on the left slide, left slide um, has, have, has, a, have a very specific task in each step of the upholstery process. I will concentrate on um, this picture and this picture. The bottom picture on the right it's a vegetal fiber called Spanish moss or Algerian grass, generally from palm tree, comes from Africa or Morocco, gets used for its non putrescible properties. It is the primary filling material for sprung seeds. It is also found domestically in the Southern states like the Southern live oak tree and the bald cypress in the lowlands, swamps and marshes of the mid Atlantic and Southeastern states. Alas, in spite of it being bountiful, domestic upholsters have no knowledge of this abundant supply source, but that is another discussion. The upper right slide shows horsehair. It's the long hair growing on manes and tails of horses, usually used as a second stuffing on common furniture, but used throughout the entire piece for luxurious and important stamped framework. Most of horsehair and tail hair is imported from South America. The corkscrew-like structure that you see here of the hair gives horsehair its elasticity and means it can keep its shape very well. One special feature of horsehair, it's its hygroscopic nature. This means that horsehair can absorb up to 25% of its own weight in moisture without feeling wet. Horsehair is still used in mattresses in Europe, and a few fabricators still use it here in New York. At night during sleep, when our, body, our bodies release moisture, this moisture can be absorbed by the mattress. During the day when the bed is aired, the moisture is released easily, especially in the summer when the temperature is high. A comfortable and dry microclimate in the bed can thus be achieved. Horsehair filled mattresses last a lifetime and are refurbished every 10 years. Same goes with upholstered furniture. The content lasts a lifetime and can be refurbished every 20 or 30 to 30 years. The next slide shows down and feathers from geese, duck or swan for the royal pillows. Several mix of the down and feathers is possible depending on the usage and function of pillows and cushioning. Here you can see different hands at work. On the left slide, it's um, Algerian grass. Then the second slide is cocoa fiber and horsehair. The third slide, it's Algerian grass. And the fourth slide is cocoa fiber and horsehair. 
Before we start dissecting the traditional French upholstery process and getting into case studies, let us get acquainted with some of the various species of furniture a French upholsterer must familiar himself or herself with. French furniture vernacular. A banquette, a bench without arms, having antecedent dating back in the 14th century. A bergère, a low armchair having upholstered or canned sides, most often with a loose cushion. A bout de pied, the end of a two or three part chaise longue or duchesse. A cabriolet, cervical back arm or side chairs. A canapé, a long open armchair first recorded circa 1663. Canapé en corbeille, a medium or large size sofa shaped like a basket. A canapé en confident, canapé and sofa with triangular ends first seen in the 18th century. A causeus, a two or three seated canapé first referred to circa 1692. Chaise de commodité, a chair in which the center is hollowed out and fitted with a bucket in lieu of a toilet. Chauffeurs, a low seat sleeper chair. Berger en confessionnal, a type of berger with wings extending the full heights of the back. A divan, a type of lit de repos without arms or back. A duchesse, a long extra wide bergère, one end having a higher back than the other, sometimes in two or three parts, called duchesse brisée. Lit de jour, a narrow bed like piece with symmetrical headboards from the 17th century. A marquise, a wide bergère or half sofa. Meridienne, a a type of sofa having a back which is descends from on and towards the other. An ottoman, a small canopy on corbeille. A prie dieu, a kneeling chair to pray. A ployant, a small folding seat. Sofa, a large seat with a back having upholstery under the arms. A sultan, a large seat having two vertical ends. Turquoise, a large seat with two upright ends and sometimes a removable back. Tête à tête, a type of causeuse. Veilleuse, the veilleuse is a type of canapé lit with hugging arms but different size, one side higher than the other. Voyelle, a special side chair with upholstery at the top of the back for sitting on backwards for gaming, designed circa 1760. Voyeuse, an armchair or bergère with an upholstered top back rail for leaning, for leaning on by a viewer standing behind a seated person. Beside learning the application of tools and supplies, a French apprentice in traditional upholstery training will be tasked to memorize all styles of French sitting furniture. This understanding and visual memorization is paramount to discern the evolution of the many different shapes that define the specific styles. You cannot upholster a Louis XVI chair in the same manner you would upholster a Louis XV or Regence chair. Each style has a very uniquely shaped profile and the French traditional upholsterer has to be versed in creating these elaborate structures using fibers and molding them into appropriate statistic historical shape. Furniture à châssis. The chassis or inserts were created as to switch decor from winter to summer. In the winter time, you would put on the seat covered with velvet or damask, and in the summer, you would exchange them for silks. As you can see here on the left slide, the frame is without the inserts and the subsequent slides, the insert are in the um, chairs. This is the four arm chairs with the stamp of the maker named Jean Gourdin, the Pierre, Pierre, Pierre Gourdin, Parisian cabinet maker, raised as a master in 1714. 
He was patronized by the Marquis de Bercy and the Duchesse de Mazarin, active 1730-1770. Fabric, Tassinari, and Châtel. The stamp that uh, you see on the upper slide um, was found on the back rail of each chair. Another um, Fauteuil à Chassis, Fauteuil Louis, Louis XV, is here as you can see the process of building the seat. This particular one had uh, little springs in order to uh, give more comfort. Two armchair Louis XV à la Reine and à Chassis. Here again, you have um, the process of recycling the seats as well as recycling the backs. The slide here uh, shows the chairs totally stitched up with the muslin on the left and with the fabric on the right. Again, with the fabric, you can see the checkered cloth on the outside back of the chair, which is very traditional as well. One pair of empire chairs with removable backs, horsehair fabric from John Boyd textile. Here the back um, is a tableau and removable. Uh, the chairs are fully upholstered with horsehair and they have a horsehair fabric as well. You can see the um, detail of the upholstery. Backrest en tableau. What is en tableau? En tableau is um, a 45 degree angle from the wood to the tip of the back. You can see on the left slide, the tip of the back has been um, covered with a gimp or a braid. And on the right slide, the tip of the back has been covered with a rope. The rope or the, the braid are hand stitch after the fact, after the, uh, the bag is upholstered. Another example of a bag a tableau, hand stitch, hand stitch work on the left, upholstered with a horsehair on the right. Backrest à la reine, which means that the backs are flat, whether it's for uh, Louis XV, Louis XVI, or even Empire. Here you have two, two examples of back à la reine and à chassis. On a Louis XVI on the left and Louis XV on the right. The squab cushion. The squab or small hair cushion used in seating and chairs is basically a miniature version of the mattress. It contains all the elements of materials and construction of the traditional unsprung mattress. Good quality curled hair is carded and teased by hand and arranged to the right thickness and density inside a sewn up case. Cases are made up from jute or linen. The case is cut and sewn and sewn up and the subsequent filling is important and allows a controllable buildup. Appeared under the reign of Louis XV, the squab cushion will become widely used until the reign of Napoleon I. It becomes then very elaborate in its fabrication and requires precise control of the materials and the stitching mechanisms. On this slide, you can see the process of making a squab cushion filled with hair. courtesy of a colleague at uh, the workshop of Versailles. The same stitch squab on the left chair and covered with fabric on the right chair. The squab cushion, once highly traditional, went through a rev revival of sorts, bringing the method to more innovative and artistic forms. Um, this is a um, class that we teach 
uh, with upholstery education. And um, this class is usually taught by Armand Verdier. And you can see the shape on the left or the right, or even the center is definitely um, not shaped like a cushion. The center slide shows the horsehair and the various needles entwined that are necessary to create those scrubs. Fabrics and trim. So let's go through a few words. You have a lampa, it's a type of fabric with a background weft, typically in tafta with supplementary weft laid on top and forming a design, typically woven in silk green with gold and silver threads enrichments. Damask, a reversible pattern fabric, silk, wool, linen, cotton or synthetic fibers with a pattern formed by weaving. Velvet, a type of tufted fabric in which the cut thread are evenly distributed, giving it a distinctive soft feel. Brocade, a richly decorative fabric, often made in colored silk and sometimes with gold and silver threads. Brocatelle, a silk rich fabric with heavy brocade designs, and finally tafta, a crisp, smooth, and plain fabric made from silk, rayon, acetate, or polyester. Here you have a sam samples of wood of 15 typical fabrics, silk lampas, silk damask, and a silk velvet here. Trimmings with a 15, silk lampa and damask with a 16, trimmings with a 16, Empire embossed silk velvet on the left. Empire silk lampa. Trimmings empire. Different braid and fringes. Art deco. Here you have a set of uh, art deco upholstered in Aubusson and Goblin needlepoint tapestries. And here you have a series of damask and lampas geometrical pattern from art deco period. Art deco trimmings. And I will switch to um, a few case studies um, done in our workshop. Case study one of five, um, it's a Louis the 16 suite uh, that includes two bergeres, two medallions, two chauffeurs, and a unique sofa. Bolstered and covered in a bespoke silk with bespoke silk trimmings from the personal collection of Michael Simon. Here you can see the sofa frame and you will notice that it's quite an unusual shape. It was originally created to fit into an alcove. And when I received the frame, it had no padding and um, no information whatsoever on how it was upholstered. The only information I had is I was able to decipher the seat and notice that it was originally upholstered with a tight plain seat. The client wanted a cushion, so I had to adapt the upholstery in order to receive a cushion in the seat. In order to do so, I had to um, spring the, the, the sofa in, in a very particular way to avoid, to avoid um, putting too much stress on the period frame. The left side shows the webbing on the seat, and this webbing is a linen webbing that will never rot. The center slides, uh, you can see a succession of small springs coming from France, and they are individually um, sprung down, and, and then they are held together with twine on the third slice. 
it was important to the, to um, to do this method of springing in order to avoid any damage or stretch or torque um, on the frame. I didn't want to damage the frame as I was springing it, basically. Here you have the decking and the front edge build up. The sprung foundation, deck and front edge complete. The left slide shows the all the springs being hand sewn to the webbing. And on the right, you can see how um, unusual this sofa is. The inside back build up, all with horse hair. The inside back and inside arms build up. Here you can see the inside arm and back in muslin and the deck and the front edge are fully upholstered, ready to receive the cushion. The left side shows you um, um, the rope being set up on the edge of the tableau. And this particular rope is hand sewn to the silk. You can see here the outside back in a plain satin and on the right, the seat cushion filled with down and feathers. The finished sofa with back pillows and those pillows are done the Turkish style with sheared corners and the application of a fringe, a silk fringe all around them. A pair of berger with a 16, same process, with the back at tableau. A pair of medallions with a 16. A pair of chauffeurs with a 16. The back at tableau, and you can see on the right slide, uh, the detail of the hand stitching on the seats under upholstery. Hand stitching details on the seats. The complete suite fabric, Christopher Highland. Case study two of five, a traditional French upholstery process on a Veilleuse Louis XV. The left side shows uh, the webbing that I use generally on period furniture, which is 100% linen, a herringbone, herringbone weave that will never rot nor collapse. So basically it is the last time this piece is being upholstered. The back build up with horse hair. The back build up with horse hair again, another view. You can see that the horse hair doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the seat. It stays midway in order to um, give room to the cushion. First stuffing of horse hair, wrapped with scream and hand stitched. Application of the second stuffing, muslin set and ready for fabric. Cotton velvet show cover, you can see the outside here. The decking is not made out of the same fabric in purpose. When this piece will be reupholstered, there will be no need to strip the deck nor stripping the um, under upholstery under that fabric. You just remove the front piece because it's hand sewn to the deck. Down cushion. Et voilà. On the left, you have the various V15 frame and on the right, the finished product. Case study three of five, um, another signed piece from Francois Rose, uh, Louis XV Sultan, stamp FRC Rose. As you can see the stamp on the upper left slide. Son of the carpenter Pierre Reuse, Francois Reuse was raised to master woodworker in 1743 
and set up his wood workshop in Rue Clery, where he worked for 50 years. He received numerous royal orders and was the main furniture manufacturer for Queen Marie Antoinette and the Swedish court. His production includes a few transi transition style seats and Louis the 16 seats, but most of his model seems to favor the Louis the 15 style. We can mention large armchairs, anarain, sofa, armchairs with a, with, with a wide flare at the back. The sculptures with which he adorns his works, often luxurious, are abundant and original, composed of foliage, rockwork, or shells. Again, you notice the type of webbing that I use in such piece. The platform deck is in muslin and the front edging also in muslin. Setting up the arm with Essian. Then the, the, the horsehair is, um, is put uh, around the, um, uh, the twine and then it is wrapped and it is hand stitched in order to form it graciously and to be homogeneous with the shape of the 18th century piece. And stitch back and slides. Application of muslin and down cushion. Here you see a side views of the outside back, which is uh, silk satin and the outside arms. The pillows and a finished piece. Case 34 of five. A pair of marquees and banquets Louis the 16, textile conservation and complete replacement of the under upholstery. The client bought this set of Louis the 16 marquees and banquets at auction. The client loved the existing fabrics and wished to preserve them. But alas, he could not live with the furniture since he was allergic to horsehair and to down. The mission, should I choose to accept it, was to preserve all fabrics and replace all original horsehair under upholstery pods with polyester hair, recreating the hair filled pods and making sure the old fabrics were going to fit right back in. The cushions were replaced with hypoallergenic latex rubber and a fiber field down substitute. This is the original in the apartment. Now the banquet has been stripped and again, you will notice the type of webbing that is used on the second slide. The platform is being rebuilt and the cushion set up. Rebuilding the arm pads with polyester hair and berger, you see a succession of the building. And the same with the inside bag. This is the old horsehair pod on the left and rebuilding it with uh, polyester hair on the right. This bag is a tableau. Building the inside arms with polyester hair. And the final product rebuild and ready for the client so he can breathe. Mm -hmm. Case 35 of five, a set of Louis XVI Berger attributed to Maison Janssen, 1880-1989. What was Maison Janssen? Paris-based design firm Maison Janssen was one of the most well-known and influential interior decorating houses of the, 20, of the 20th century. Patronized by royalty, socialites, leader of nations and other luminaries of elite society, it was also one of the first truly global design firms. Founded in 1880 by Dutch designer Jean-Henri Janssen, 1854-1928, Maison Janssen originally sourced existing antiques or contracted outside cabinet makers to produce furniture when producing custom interiors for clients. By the 1890s, however, the firm began to manufacture furnishings in-house. By the 20s, Maison Janssen had offices around the world, 
during the early 20s, Stephen Boudin, 1888-1967, joins Johnson as the chief designer and director. His attention to detail, concern for, for historical accuracy amongst his many projects, Boudin was responsible for the renovations of the White House, including the Red Room during the administration of John F. Kennedy. By 1930, Maison Janssen five-story Paris Atelier employed over 700 highly skilled artisans. So under one roof, you had um, the designers and the artists, as well as the skilled craft people to execute the vision of the designers. So the designers had total control of the output and over the final production of the pieces, whether it was upholstery or complete interiors. Maison Janssen design aesthetic was forward thinking and countercultural, even as the firm came to specialize in high-end reproductions. Amongst the many styles, Maison Janssen's furniture and interiors drew from our 18th century Bourbon court, the aesthetic movement, Art Nouveau, Art Modern, and even mid-century modernism. The firm's genius lay in mining the past for forms, colors, and materials that were sure to make an impact. In 1989, 60 years after the death of its founder, Maison Janssen closed its doors. Today, Maison Janssen's designs are highly sought after by collectors. The most valuable and collectible examples of Maison Janssen furniture are 18th century antiques that were appropriated and reupholstered by Maison Janssen in the late 19th century. To date, the record for highest priced Maison Janssen piece was set at a Christie in London in 2005, when a suite of Louis XVI parcels gilt seat furniture, originally designed by Mathieu Bove in 1775 and reupholstered by Pierre Delby, Delby of Maison Janssen, realized $416,000. is you have an example of what Maison Janssen was creating. This is the Ronald Tree residence in England. This is the salon, blue and white bedroom. The tapestry room. Now we go back to um, those four bergeres. Upholstery build up with mixed medium on four Louis XVI Berger attributed to Maison Janssen. You can see the foundation, webbing foundation on the seat and all sprung up on the right slide. This slide represents the webbing foundation on the back and the coil springs and building up the back to receive horse air which is on your left, the first layer of horse hair and the second layer of horse hair on the right. The arms are upholstered with horse hair as well. And the wood that you see on top of them is to make sure that everything is leveled from one end to the other. Covering the back and the seats. Now you can see that the uh, fabric had to be uh, matched not only on the cushion, but also on the side with a little border that is around the inside back. Fabric is a brocade from Christopher Islands with gold and silver threads. Non-intrusive upholstery treatment on a set of Charles Honoré Lannuy, 1779-1819. For the John J. Homestead, courtesy of the New York State Preservation Office. A mixed medium upholstery in a conservation context. Here you have the backs that are built on removable substrates. In the backs are done a tableau with polypropylene edging and horsehair.
the seats are upholstered with horsehair and polypropylene edging as well on removable substrate with linen webbing base, nine ounce linen hessian, cotton he linen hessian, jute cream, cotton wadding, and linen slash cotton muslin. The chair are then covered with a silk damask. All fabrics are unsewn to tag bands and those tag bands um, are wrapped and secured with tags on existing nail holes. All the inserts are friction fitted to chair. So there is no new tacking on the frames. A Louis XVI suit from the bedroom of Thierry de Ville d'Avray, stamped Jean-Baptiste Claude Séné, 1748, 1803, raised master in 1769. Presently on display at the Boston Museum of Art, conservation courtesy of Maison Brasa in Paris, published in L'Objet d'Art magazine in January 2003. Here is a voyelle Louis XVI with removable substrates upholstered in a traditional manner. Forensic upholstery was done to recreate the shape of these particular pieces. They were able to found original um, under upholstery and replicate this under upholstery with the same material in the same manner as it was done in 1700s. There is no foam, no ether foam, just horsehair, scrim, and twine. Same concept and same method for this Louis XVI Berger à la Reine. Upholstered traditionally and in a, tradi in a um, beautiful uh, damask from Tassinara Chatel. And now we'll move to artistic creative upholstery or how a traditional paradigm gets stretched to its limits. Here you have um, different chairs. Um, as you can see, um, on this particular chair here, that represent a flower. Um, everything is done manually by encasing fiber, whether it's coconut fiber or Algerian grass or horsehair. And it's wrapped with the um, jute um, burlap and hand stitched throughout. There is no wire to create the form. The same here. Here you have a chair entitled La, Bête, La Belle et La Bête, courtesy of Nadej Foin Braquet. This is the original frame with the under upholstery structures and the fabric. Here you have a graduating project uh, advanced diploma courtesy of the British School of Upholstered Furniture. Again, whether it is at this particular chair here or this leaf looking chair or this cabbage chair or this particular divan, it's all upholstered using traditional manner. There is no foam. There's some springs here under that and also here, I think, but it's all fiber and molded by hand and hand stitched by hand. It's hand stitches by hand anyway, right? Here you have creative upholstery courtesy of Katarina Gibb. You can see the way she expressed herself on this chair where she left exposed the outside and the front and you can see the other upholstery. Uh, you can see the squab here, the squab cushion is all hand stitched. And all this is hand stitch as well, like a quilting.
Conclusion. Traditional, traditional upholstery after being shunned for decades is experiencing a rebirth in a newly found appreciation. Thanks to teaching institutions rooted in cultural tradition in a renewed interest based on artistic, social and environmental values. The traditional craft is here to stay and the interest that it generates is giving to new generation a unique vehicle for artistic expression within the paradigm of furniture design. I would like to credit the following, uh, La Bonne Grande Technical College, Bull College of Applied Arts, Compagnon de Devoir, Mobilier National, Maison Brasé, Nancy Britton, Francis Bretter, the British School of Upholstered Furniture, Upholstery Education, Guild of Traditional Upholsterers, Association of Master Upholsterers and Self Furnishers, Michael Simon, Laurent Janet at the Versailles Conservation Lab, Nadesh Point Braque, Katerina Gibb, Filippo Tapissier, New York State Preservation, Prel and Company, Tassinerie et Châtel, John Boyd Textile, and Christopher Highland. Thank you very much. Bruno, all I can say is bravo. That was absolutely Thank fantastic. Thank you. What a wonderful, comprehensive presentation. And I think we can see why there has been a renaissance and uh, such avid interest in that poster. So thank you so much. For You're explaining. welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, we'd now like to take some questions for our online audience. Please uh, type type them and send them to Meg and she will pass them on to me. And for our in-person audience, we will take some questions. Bruno, well, fabulous, but I'll say more later. Two questions. Can you tell us about your, um, your initiative in terms of upholstery education? And then just a second question. You know, when you first came to the United States from France, could you touch on how you ended up at the Berkeley College of Music and how that informs your work? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, upholstery education um, is um, is um, a structure where we teach um, students how to do upholstery in a traditional way, and. Um, as well as a contem contemporary way, but mostly traditional. We hold classes once a year, and we hope to hold classes uh, several times a year. It's a, a new venture, and we are very excited um, about um, the way it has uh, developed and uh, how uh, people are really um, thrilled to, to attend the classes. Um, the classes is composed with um, different uh, masters. Um, there is uh, two Frenchmen um, and three um, British fellows. Um, and um, like I said, the goal is to hold classes several times a year because uh, the demand is really there. As to Berkeley College of Music, that's the reason why I came to the country originally. And um, I uh, graduated in 1983 long time ago and um that's old history <laughs> and i don't know i don't play the trumpet anymore sorry <laughs> sorry not, not today anyway uh right we have a an online question um now where do you actually get your horse hair from this is from june novelich uh the horse hair we i get it uh from philadelphia Mm -hmm. for the FP Wall Company. Okay, I'm gonna take some in-person questions. What is a regulator? Good question. A, regula a regulator is a very sharp tool that uh, helps bring the um, stuffing or whether it's a vegetal stuffing or horse hair forward in order to create an edge all around either the seat or the back. Once the stuffing or the fiber is regulated, it is then stitched 
uh, in order to hold the shape forever. Thank you. Just a technical question about the fabrics. What is the difference between a lampas weave and a brocade woven? I think the the, um, the lampa in the brocade, um, it's a different type of threads. I got the brocade has gold and uh, silver threads in it. That's the main. And the lampas has. No, that is no, no, no. The lampa doesn't have that type of threading. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And we have a question uh, now uh, from our online audience. And this is from John Brewer. Now, how different is it to use synthetic materials to achieve the same look as traditional horsehair? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yes. How, well, I think it actually, how difficult, it, how difficult is it to use synthetic materials to achieve the same look as traditional horsehair? Not difficult at all. It's just a matter of shaping the foam or other type of elements uh, appropriately. So they, they reflect the original shape, but it's not hard at all. Right, well, I have a follow-up question to that then. Um, do you think there is a, uh, a time in the future that synthetic material will replace horsehair or would that be sacrilege? Sacrilege. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions? Yes, we do. No. Oh, oh. Um, can you expand a little more on the training that you offer and where? And can one do it if one is not an experienced upholsterer? Yes, <clears throat> one can do it if, if not experienced upholsterer, definitely. Um, the little video I show, um, this intern um, was not an experienced upholsterer at all. She learned everything from scratch, literally. Um, the class right now, it's once a year, twice a year maximum. I think the next class would be uh, this uh, summer or this fall. And in order to keep up the, um, the schedule, you would have to go on the site, upholstery.com, I mean, uh, upholstereducation.com. Uh, the 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 location of the class of the next class hasn't been determined yet. It's either going to be in Long Island or here. Hi, um, I see some of these pieces probably have been upholstered uh, a few times. I was wondering if you take any steps to preserve the wood frames, or how do you minimize the damage? Well, the upholstery. right. Um, when the frame is uh, really um, damaged, um, we restore it. We restore it with a uh, combination of uh, sanding, dust, and um, polyvinyl, poly, polyvinyl acetate glue, and we create a substance that has the consistency of peanut butter, and we fill all the holes in order to avoid any more uh, damage. It's one method. Uh, another method is to, when it's really bad, is to replace the tacking, the tacking um, structures. And the third method, third method is to use a composite, um, a two-step composite um, that is um, basically um, uh, a very hard and rigid um, um, glue but I don't have the name in my mind at that time. Is that answer the question or? Is but most, when it's really bad, uh, we, we, when it's really bad, we cut the uh, old wood and we replace with new tacking structure, new tacking, new tacking wood. It's done, it's done a lot in France like that too. Cause at one point it's not possible to save them. At some, some pieces also just the face of the chair is saved and everything on the inside of the frame is replaced. I'm interested in frames also. Do they just magic themselves into being? Because you speak about upholstery, but um, many of those bergeres and sofas had to have the wood frames to start with. And secondly, they look very fragile, are they? 
they are not that fragile, no. They can't be, right, to survive. They, they, they can be, but also, you know, you have to put them in context, in culture, cultural context. I mean, whoever sat on these pieces are not large people. Hmm. <laughs> so they were not, you know, they were, you know, I mean, you would, if you, if you would, uh, how can I say that? Um, the frames are fragile, but the construction and the geometry uh, of frames is such that um, it's not falling apart on you when you sit on it. Um, and the wood that is used is also very strong. Maple, maple. Um, on the no, it's mostly European beech. Hmm? European beech, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the on the. Do you the teach frame are... making? No, you don't. Somebody has to make them. Hmm. <laughs> Just That's upholstery. not your problem. No, just mm. upholstery. Thank you. Um, right, this uh, um, this will be one of our last questions. Um, this is from online. This is from Sylvina online. How do you deal with silk velvet from Prell without damaging it? Have I pronounced that correctly? Uh, depending on the piece, is that a... Um, is the, is the prel is the prel velvet going to be sewn or is the prel velvet just um, stretch over or what is the context? There, I'm afraid you have me, Bruno. And unless Savina responds very quickly online, I'm afraid we 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 won't know. Um, but I'll take a take. But, I but, will but regard, okay. regardless, right. it is possible to use uh, <laughs> gloves in order to deal with such velvet. Right. Right, well, we'll see if Sylvina responds very quickly, but in the meantime, I'm gonna take another question from the audience. And I think if we, okay, I'll take, I think, okay, two more questions. I wanted to ask you about how many hours one Bejer chair, it, what's what's the, t the time spent to completely- um, for, France, for qualified journeymen in France, about uh, 20 hours. No, that's a certain that is shorter, I think, than many of us would have anticipated the answer would be. For for a trained journeyman in France, 20 hours. Right. Someone that has been trained properly with the, you know, because that's all you have to understand that the French upholsterer doing a berger is nothing exotic. It's bread and butter, really. Right. Okay. So well, the, the the more and the more they, they do that continually, continuously. So the more they do it, the faster they get. Okay, well, okay. I said, um, I'm going to take two more questions, actually, because there's a, 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 some ladies over here. Okay, so we'll, and we still haven't heard from Sophina. I, I'm sorry, I came in late, but who in New, maybe this was answered, who in New York, do, you know, does the best work in upholstery, traditional upholstery? <laughs> You're in New York? You're in New York. Okay. There, there is a few people. Well, had I known that, I would. <laughs> There's a few people. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I think Bruno is very much available and um, would be interested in many queries, I would think. Okay, so we're going to take our final few questions. Um, so you mentioned that horsehair is also used as the fabric on the outside. Yes. Do you know how that's created? Like, uh, is it? It's fa it's a mix of horsehair and cotton uh, threads. So not just hundred percent horsehair. Horsehair seems like it would be very um, sort of textural, like horse. Horse, yes. Yeah, but it's not. It's it's very refined. It's it's uh, it's uh, glazed and it's very. There is absolutely no no coarseness to it when you sit on it. No. Yes. Hi. So my question is this. When you said that there was this rejection of traditional upholstery techniques, are you referring really just to the materials used, that there would be a push towards using man-made or modern? What, what, if you could def define what you mean by that rejection or shunning is your shunning, word. Shunning, yes. Um, uh, it's all about time and quality and um, the lack of uh, traditional training in this country. Um, 
first of all, the uh, training takes a while. It takes about two years minimum to train properly um, in traditional upholstery. Um, traditional upholstery takes time to, to make. And um, what you sell at the end is you sell the hours that you have, that you have put in the object. So um, if you can do a sofa is hot in 120 hours, you can do the same sofa in half the time with modern materials. It's an easier sale to the general public. So um, one of the um, factor that contributed is basically that it was taking too long to, um, to make and the, the, the market was not there. So you had to be replaced with form and so forth. Does that answer the question? Good. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Well, I'm just going to conclude with a follow-up comment from Sylvine. We have her, we have Sylvina, we have heard from her. Um, and just to remind you, the first question that she asked Bruno was: how do you deal with silk velvet from Prell without damaging it? And this is this is what she was, this is what she was pondering. At home, every time people sit on these pieces, the velvet gets crushed. You must have magic hands to handle it. Well, uh, when you upholster with um, with a pre velvet, sometimes I use uh, gloves, and I'm, I'm very careful about the way I operate and I handle the fabric. That's for sure, because it doesn't the 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 pile doesn't, once scratched the pile doesn't necessarily come back right away. So you have to be extremely careful. And I have those white gloves that are very fine and that's what I use to handle it so I don't mark it. Fantastic. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you could see, our audience has many questions and I'm sure Bruno will be happy to take some questions after the end of this uh, presentation and hope you'll join us for a glass of wine, our in-person audience. But again, Bruno, I just want to thank you so much because the yeah. huge amount of work, and as I use the word comprehensive before, that doesn't even begin to describe your very clear description of the craft of upholstery. And we are just so delighted that you could share it with us tonight and also to see your beautiful workmanship. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bruno. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And to say a few additional words, Victoria Dengel, our executive director. Thank you, Karen. And to Bruno, our dear, dear friend, your uh, before it's uh, your Instagram account, because you can see Bruno's work on Instagram. So what is your account? It's Bruno Pona Lopez on Instagram. Yeah, it's really, it. you, you do a beautiful job and Thank you. the photographs are exquisite, as is your work. And, you know, we've known Bruno, what's now, it's 12, 12 years. And Bruno was one of the original artisans when Jean Huyart started the Artisan series. He right selected five artisans and there the, the friendship with the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen began. And Bruno has been a faithful lecturer and has shared his wonderful work and he is one of a kind. And for that, we are so grateful. So thank you, Bruno. And thank you what you do to carry forth your profession mm -hmm. and, and really carry it forth for future generations and for all of the work that you're doing. Thank you. It's, it's so beautiful. So we have a, a couple of things for you. Can you see? Oh, your bag of goodies. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we have a, a tie. It was our 225th anniversary. You know, you lose track <laughs> when you're 238 years old. But, and that's a tie. A tie very much. By Hammer in Hand, all arts do stand. Mm -hmm. And then, I have to show that to the well, place. Yes, very good. Yes, well done. Because you've been so faithful, and he really is. I think it's a. It's probably you're getting up there with a record of appearances. So, um, we also have the lore of the lock because you haven't yet selected a favorite lock. So if you could <laughs> come oh, back, thank you very much. <laughs> That's every lock, and then, well, oh, this is great. Just one more, and if our audience, you know, because obviously we're treating Bruno very. In a very special way. So if you could just not tell the next one, sure. <laughs> How generous we were. 
<laughs> and American Genius, oh, because if you didn't know about it, there was a follow-up to the Lure of the Lock. So there you go. Thank That's you so much. Season. Appreciate it. Very much. All right. Yeah. Thank you. This is great. And finally, a little memento of tonight, the oh, poster. Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. And to our audience who's here tonight, thank you. We love seeing you. And to our uh, online audience as well. We really appreciate Thank you for coming. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm just going to do a, a quick run through, a very quick run through of just upcoming lectures. We have Heaven on the Hudson, um, Mansions, Monuments and Marvels of uh, Riverside Park, and that's with Stephanie Arizoni, and that's next Tuesday, April 18th. And then the Magnificent Bridges of New York City with Dave Frider on Tuesday, April 25th. And and one other thing I'm going to mention, because there's many more lectures to come, but music into film, the transition in the digital age with David Polemony on Tuesday, May 2nd. Thank you all so much for coming, both online and in person. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to Bruno. Thank, thank you. you.